Hi everyone and welcome to our second in the series of wealth content sessions. Uh, in case you missed the first one, it was uh, it was cracking so you should really uh, check it out. Um, we enjoyed it so much we thought we'd do it again. So just to remind you, these are kind of monthly sessions that we challenge ourselves as a leadership team to have. Um, and again, we thought we'd record it and, and share some of the output. Um, today we're going to be talking about process improvement. Um, so I've got a few questions for the team. Um, so, Carl, I'm going to start with you. What do you think are the typical barriers we come across when trying to implement a culture of continuous improvement? Good question, Matt. Thank um, you. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, really interesting. I think um, we, we see it um, attempted in a number of different ways. I think that there are organisations who uh, probably about five, ten years ago adopted some of the principles around lean, um, around Six Sigma, etc., and almost in, tried to embed a, a, a culture within the organisation of constantly challenging the way things are done uh, and being brave about accepting um, that kind of perfection is not necessarily achievable, but it's certainly something to work towards and constantly try and evolve as business evolves. And I think that's particularly with operations functions where we do a lot of work, we see a lot of those teams having been set up, a lot of good work having been done. And often uh, that sustains, but in many cases, we also see that it's, it's one of those areas that's targeted when business drops off and there are cost challenges in an organisation and they look at some of the teams where perhaps perceived value isn't quite as um, immediate or obvious as in other teams who are there to service customers and who are there to drive the business forward in different ways. Uh, and often it's just a, a consequence really of a challenging business environment or a change in business sponsor or a change in the way the business runs its operations, whether it's perhaps looks at outsourcing or doing something different or moving to more digital capabilities. And so sometimes that culture of continued improvement just organically kind of drifts away, either because the business has changed what it's doing or because the people who were there who drove it and sponsored it and, and were the driving force behind it have perhaps moved on to other things. So that's, that's one area. I think there's some other, other challenges in terms of having the right skills and capabilities in organisations to drive forward change and to drive forward that concept and culture of continued improvement. It needs to be constant. It, it's kind of in the name, it's continual. It's not, it's not a project and part of the challenge we see sometimes is it's perceived as a, as a defined piece of work for three months or six months or nine months. And actually, unless you embed it in the organisation and you incentivise and you empower people to drive change, which I think is really, really important, giving people the skills and the empowerment and the mandate to actually go and make those changes within their teams and within their processes, you, you're reliant on a project each time. And each time that project needs funding and it needs approval and it's going to fight with everything else. So for me, part of the challenge is seeing con in continually embedded within the business and not seeing it as a project thing that happens over a defined piece of time. I think CI is absolutely fascinating and obviously it originated in manufacturing and I think you see in the manufacturing sector that it has that longevity and they're never really kind of targeted as heavily when there's bad times. I think part of that is the fact that CI teams and CI professionals have targets. You know, it's very rare in manufacturing that you'll see a Lean Six Sigma black belt um, without a target. Why do you think that hasn't materialised in the same way within services? I think I think part of it for me is that the manufacturing, and I think obviously Toyota was the was was the kind of case study several years ago, wasn't it? And that's all about that factory process of taking a part, turning it into something usable, and moving it down the the, the kind of factory line. Um, and it's all about kind of widget processing. And I think in certain parts of servicing. Um, there's some challenges in replicating that kind of model and that kind of culture in a world that can be quite different. Where there's perhaps more exception processes, perhaps where there's um, challenges around the inputs that are different every single time, uh, where you can have less control over some of those things because they're outside of your company boundaries. So what a customer does or what an advisor does is different to perhaps what a supplier does when they're supplying parts into a car production line. So I think part of the challenge there is that widget processing isn't quite the same in the services industry as perhaps it is in others. Yeah, I think it's much, much harder to see the return on investment and therefore they're an easy target when things aren't going quite so well, potentially. Who else has got a view on that? Anyone else? 
the guys have said it pretty much all but um yeah i think operationally i think you've articulated it really well but the barriers tend to be exactly what you've said in terms of you know it's not a continual thing that happens in organizations it's almost like a tick box for some businesses to say we've got a ci team if anybody asks that thing and it, it actually doesn't fruition a lot of the time um and you do spend a lot of time money and efforts in training people and getting people excited about it and then it disappears and it disbands for other priorities and other activity um and 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 it isn't it is it is sorry a very scientific uh, uh, to nick's point where it's inherited from it's very scientific in its approach and that isn't necessarily practical um you know it's a methodology it's a way of working but there's adaptations that are required whether that's in wealth management fs or any other industry really um it's important to remember those nuances Cool, thanks. And um, so what about then, so along the same theme around uh, culture of continuous improvement, but I guess what's the key to making sure that um, companies uh, continue in that vein once a, a program has been delivered and disbanded? Dom, uh, you got a view on that? Um, yeah, well, obviously, um, Carl and, and, and Nick, what you said, I absolutely agree with. I think you've, you've covered most of it. I think as, as Carl's mentioned, kind of empowerment and getting the right people in, in, the, in the right team and, and giving them um, that ownership is really important. But I think also what isn't done enough is um, taking what the project's done, and that could be from the deliverables of the project, or it could be the people that are working within that project. Because obviously the minute that the project gets implemented, you may have some tidying up to do, making sure that you know there's no live issues and we'll sort that out and then we'll all go our separate way and that's really um going to to cause a problem within the business when you actually say well we did all of that work we've we've had you embedded in our business we've committed smes to this so that we can reap benefits and what isn't done enough is project teams sticking around for long enough to realize those benefits and giving the business what you know the skills and knowledge um and, and the structure to, to continually um, uh, get those benefits out. I think um, uh, one thing that, that that kind of we've seen when when Simplify have been in there is actually businesses are really keen to have us perform some of that that role. So have some training, um, or we can provide some training. So in process improvements, a really good example. You know, they're really keen for us to share our knowledge with the business and that's something we can absolutely do. Um, but I just don't think that that's widely appreciated within the business, how important it is to just commit to that extra, you know, it can only maybe only be a couple of weeks or a month and it really, really gives the business something to build on uh, in the future. I think that's a really good point, Dom. I think um, the other, the other challenge is uh, kind of the, the book I haven't yet written, which is phase two never happens. <laughs> Um, because you know every project no project I've ever worked on has delivered everything it set out to achieve when it started off you know you get into this well actually what's an MVP and what do we really need to do to get this over the line and invariably phase, phase two may or may not happen phase three probably won't happen and the business is left with this legacy of a project that's gone and implemented something but perhaps not what it wanted but maybe 50 60 70 percent of what it want what it wanted and the challenge then is for that business to take on what wasn't delivered and build a business case and implement some of those things potentially on their own or potentially with project support, which then goes back into the world of, well, it's a project again. And again, they'll get 50% of what they asked for. So I guess it's that challenge of finding a way in which, to your point, there's that handover, there's that cross-skilling, there's that training into the operation to give them the skills, the expertise and the capability to go and do some of the things that the project has helped them with previously and do that in a different way, whether that's you know, weekly implementations or a more agile approach. I think some of those companies that take a project and then embed a, a philosophy of continued improvement are perhaps more successful than some others. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. And I think just picking up and taking that a little bit further, certainly a lot of experience of projects I've had, you get, um, you develop SMEs almost as part of the, the project and at the end of the project those SMEs disappear uh, because they go off and do something else. Um, I've, I've seen some examples of where those people who develop into SMEs in that particular subject matter then go it back into the business 
almost just champions of that mm. particular change yeah. and I've seen instances of where that has worked really really well um, because they are then there to continue that education and support and when you talk about the the day twos that never happen um, those SMEs are able to drive those forwards in um, conjunction with the actual business itself um, and I think personally I'd like to see more of that kind of approach because I think it works really really well in certain circumstances. Yeah I think that's really key and, and Dom and I can probably refer to one particular program I think Matt as well where the concept of change champions were were fundamentally part of the project. They were taken from the business, but it was almost a secondment, and then they were taken back into the business to not just see the change through, but to help them drive it forward. So they were championing the change, which is great, because sometimes you come up with a bit of reluctance to support, and sometimes it's difficult to embed change in, in certain functions, but actually bringing them into the, the project itself and then letting them go back and carry on the good work is a really good way of embedding that. Yeah. I think often a lot of this you will see with just a really um, a tight construct of an implementation plan as to how these projects are, are executed and allowing enough time for that education, that handover, um, that those champions to instill the knowledge and grow and share that as well. Um, and there's different methods and approaches that could be used for that, like drop-ins and, you know, just to, like, as you say, for that, for the, the closure of that project and moving forwards is to different channels just to keep the engagement there so that people aren't forgetting or whether that's a cadence of monthly updates and all of that can be built into a plan. But as you've pointed out, it, it's often forgotten about. It's done and dusted at that point in time, um, which is never, as we all know, not really the end of a project. <laughs> Great. OK, thanks, everyone. Um, I, I guess the final area that I wanted to explore that's kind of interlinked. So simplified DNA. Uh, Nick, I know it's um, dear to your heart. Um, can you perhaps tell us a bit around kind of um, how we've leveraged the capability model to accelerate mapping, for example? Yep, more than happy to do that. So Simplified DNA uh, is a wealth orientated model um, covering advisors, DFMs, networks, platforms, asset managers, everything in between. So it's full end to end of wealth. You can find details on our website if you want to look. <laughs> Carl, you can pay me later. <laughs> is, is this uh, the high, highly polished advert section? <laughs> yes. Uh, I now talk normally. Um, <laughs> So in essence, it, it holds a number of process maps within the wealth management space um, and we use it in a number of different ways. Um, so first off, um, we use it to ensure the correct scope from the outset. So typically when we approach an engagement, we get given a set of maps from a client at lots of different levels um, and that is the request to form the basis of the scope. Um, so we use our set of um, maps and our model to cross-reference um, what we are given to what we expect. Um, so we can typically make sure that we um, set the right scope from the outset uh, and we don't have any gaps um, and typically we see very little scope creep using that approach. Secondly, we use our model uh, when it comes to the process mapping elements itself. Um, so we can use it in one or two ways. We can use our existing maps to challenge existing ways of thinking. Um, so why couldn't your processes look like this um, and kind of challenge maybe some entrenched um, uh, kind of beliefs and thoughts and, you know, all the historical stuff that comes from somebody owning a process for five, 10, 15 years, you know, they get quite emotional uh, about their, their maps that they've owned and run for quite a period of time. Um, and uh, having conversations around, have you thought about these common integrations? And it really adds to a level of robustness to the approach. On the, on the other side of the scale, if no process diagrams exist um, and we're starting from a blank sheet of paper, um, what we're able to do is use our, our best in class maps to essentially start from version 0.9. So nobody starts with a blank sheet, sheet of paper. We can bring up a new business process for a SIP and ask how can we align to do this and we can configure that um, process to suit that particular client and that really accelerates engagements and ways of thinking around you know, why couldn't we move to this and a, a better way of working in the future 
I'm sure that's exactly how I described it when I was put on the spot yesterday, Nick, and was asked about the capability model. Good. You've been listening. Yeah, you, you obviously took that from me. <laughs> what about the future then of the capability model, Nick? Where where can it take us? Where what's the kind of what else will it do in the future, perhaps? Or I think it's used already on ninety nine percent of our engagements. Um, you know, it is absolutely at the core of everything that we do. It's been built up over a number of years um, with the combined knowledge of all the consultants in Simplify. Um, we use it for target operating model design, process improvement, tech stack comparison, product and feature launches. There's already a huge range of features and use cases that it's applicable to. Um, and you know, it will evolve over time. It will have um, more depth, more breadth. It will cover more products. Um, so if you want to find out more, then book a demo. Brilliant. Okay, cool. All right. I think we're um, out of time. So again, thank you everyone for your sharing your views. It's um, most appreciated. Thanks for, for watching everyone. And again, uh, keep an eye out for future sessions that we will be discussing uh, on a monthly basis. Thanks for your time. Thanks everyone. Bye.